first things first, you know, in, in, in the line of things, um, uh, do not stare at my legs during this message. <laughs> I clearly told you in the newsletter and in the announcements that you ought to dress like you're going to a picnic, because I am. I lived up to my word. Some of you are severely overdressed for a picnic. <laughs> Now, if they let me, this is a way I dress most all the time. But, um, yeah, that's something else that's happening today, and I want to tell this to any of the, um, uh, anybody in the age range of middle school, high school, or, or thereabouts. We have recently launched a thing called Fuel. It is an event that's happening every two weeks, and tonight is another, um, yeah, another go-round of Fuel, and we are... Students, if you want to know the things that you simply must know to make it through your life successfully with Jesus Christ, come to Fuel. We are working our way through that and everything that we do. We're dealing with the seven checkpoints that you need to be aware of. It's worth your time. There is going to be a competition on Mario Kart to start off with at about 445. Might be a surprise after that. We're going to have some food. We, uh, we, we engage in some music, and then tonight's uh, uh, lesson or this evening's message is going to be how do you actually make spiritual disciplines work? It's going to be great. Hope you can join us on that. I also want to bring attention to RSK, which is Rock Springs Kids. It is a really wonderful environment, and we have volunteers that make that happen because they love Jesus, and they love your family, and they want to see Jesus and your family engaged. It is a very safe place, always has been. We do secure check-in, background checks, all kinds of stuff because we care about your kids. We care about your family, and uh, so we're doing everything we can to help make that happen. If you'd like to be uh, uh, taken on a tour, or if you'd like more information about that, you can reach out. I know that those who are in, uh, hosting the online campus can answer questions on that, and then you can also talk to volunteers on that side. I also was given a note before I, I came up on the platform be sure to remind all parents of RSK kids that as soon as the service is over, before the picnic begins, you still have to go and retrieve your children. <laughs> and because we have a lot of fun as a team, that was Bethany telling me that I needed to do this, and I just simply sent back two, two letters, no. And, because she knew that I was kidding. And she said, well, then I'll tell everybody it's going to be Pastor David playtime, and he'll have to, <laughs> like, so... We love your family. We love your kids. Please remember to retrieve your children before we do the picnic. Let me also tell you about that. Um, online campus, I do wish we could duplicate this. You go have your own picnic. And then about 1230, we're going to baptize and, uh, and have a special time of uh, baby dedication as well. But uh, if you came today, didn't know about the picnic, didn't know about baptism, as soon as we're done at around 1130, uh, you can run home, get a side. We're taking care of the hamburgers, the hot dogs, the buns, and then we've also got a, we've got a whole ton of potato salad and coleslaw. You do whatever it is you need to do beyond that. When I say sides, a lot of you think dessert, so you go, you do that, okay? And bring it back. If you've got a pop-up, you know, to, to get some shade, get your camp chair. We're going to meet out on the east parking lot. And uh, we got it set up with the baptistry, and it's just going to be something you do not want to miss because whenever we baptize, we have an opportunity for each of those who are getting baptized to tell their story, however brief or long that may take. And uh, we do that, and then we get in the water, and we, 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 we recreate that picture of dying to our old life, living to our new one, the picture of Jesus living, dying, rising again. It's just a wonderful thing. Wonderful, wonderful. We're, doing, we're going to be baptizing about six people. Are y'all excited? I'm excited. Oh, so excited. So I wanted to talk about baptism because, you know, uh, let's just, let's, let's just, let's, let's <clears throat> traditions, traditions are a good thing. As long as you don't lose track of where those traditions started and what they are supposed to mean. Here's an example of what I mean is that Leanne and I have a friend that when she opens cans, like a, a you know, can of green beans or, or anything like that, she always turns it upside down. And we asked her one time whenever we were over there, we asked her, why do you do that? And she said, well, I don't really know why. It's, it's just, um, it, it's, my mom always did. Well, that led to a discussion. It's like, well, mom, why did you do that? So she called up her mom and she asked her mom, you know, uh, you turned it upside down and you opened the bottom of the can. Why do you do that? And she said, oh, honey, we used to keep all of our canned goods down in the cellar. And with all of you kids running around, I didn't have time to dust off the top. So I just turned it upside down and opened the bottom. 
Okay, nothing wrong with the tradition actually makes sense, but the daughter had lost the bearings of why that was a thing. She thought it was magical or something. The same thing can also apply to baptism. And I, I really, you know, whenever I, I've told you this, when I speak to you, I, I consider it an honor. I am humbled by the fact that I get to try and point people to Jesus and help understand what Scripture is trying to get over to us. When I'm talking to, to you, a lot of you are going to go, yeah, I know that. I've been around church all my life. Because baptism, if you're, how many of you would say your background is Baptist? See, you already think you got it. It's already in your religious uh, you know, qualifications and, and, and uh, you know, I'm Baptist. We do it right. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm also talking to people like, I have no earthly idea what this baptism, it sounds kind of freakish. Is this a cult? You know, what are, what are we doing here? Um, baptism can have so many different meanings to so many different people. And over the years, what I've noticed is people... What you think about baptism probably comes from your tradition, whether it's a fully ingrained tradition or it's something you picked up from grandma, grandpa, aunt or uncle, or somebody across the street. Because you might go, well, we've got to baptize babies. We've got to baptize babies. That started about 300 years after the Bible was completely uh, you know, brought together. Um, and, and, and it was done with this idea that it was attached, like baptism was attached to some sort of salvation. You're not saved without it, so let's baptize the kids so that we make sure that they're saved. That's not in Scripture, but it is a tradition. So is that what we're talking about? No. Baptism that I want to explain to you is different. Than, I also know that um, uh, some people say, well, you've got to be baptized when you're eight years old. There's a specific day that you're supposed to get baptized, and you might have come from that tradition. It's like, I don't know. That's not in Scripture. Uh, you know, like I was raised Baptist and it was always, you know, the age of accountability is 12 years old. That also is not in Scripture. <laughs> However, generally speaking, around 10, 8, 11, 12 years old, someone does finally understand that their decision to follow Christ is definitely theirs. And that is why it often is, is held that way. Um, let me just give you the, the, the short reason. And some of you, you're already fading. You haven't had enough coffee, so have a nice nap. But Remember this while you're napping. What we're doing today is we're trying to stay true to, and the reason that we're baptizing is because Jesus said, right before he left to go back to heaven, he said, I want you to go, and you actually use words that mean as you go. Y'all are all standing here looking at me, but you need to, y'all get out of here and go. And as you go, tell people the things that I've taught you. And among those, the chief that is, love God, love your neighbor, and then he also said, and love each other like I've loved you. That's, that's what he said. Go and tell people that, as well as all the other teachings. And he says, when you do that, and then they believe on to me like you have, because now you understand that I am who I say I am, and that I will do what I said I will do, once they make that kind of decision like you have, then you go baptize them. Anybody ahead of me here? In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Not in the name of David, not in the name of Rock Springs, not in the name of any of the apostles. It's baptize them in the name of the Father, the Holy, uh, I mean, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's it. You can take a nap. Let me tell you some other stuff for those of you who are actually interested in this. Because there is actually background to baptism, and you need to understand what was at stake and what, how it got to where it is today. How did it come to this? How, what led up to this? Why do we do it this way? Why do we, as Rock Springs, as a church body, why do we consider it something happy and a celebration? These are very important questions because if you just stop and go back because words mean things, baptism is a weird word. I mean, when do you use it other than whenever we're talking at church? Or maybe you say, boy, I had a real baptism by fire. Okay. The word... It, I don't know if you knew this or not, but the, the documents, the 66 documents that make up the Bible, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, the Old Testament written before Jesus, the second half, the 27 are written about Jesus and everything that followed. These were written, guess what? They were not written in English. Startling thing. Didn't, it didn't originate in, 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 uh, in English. They actually were written in Hebrew. How many of you speak Hebrew? Two or three, maybe? Okay, that's good. Uh, they were also written in Aramaic, which is considered a dead language, and yet people still speak it in some parts of the world. 
It was also written in Greek, Koine Greek, everyday Greek, because Greek had an everyday language and then it had a, a, like a legal language. But these documents were written in Hebrew, Aramaic, Koine Greek, and then somewhere back along the line, we've talked about this before, they were actually translated from those original writings into English. Yay! You go, why are you saying yay? Do you know what an incredible blessing that is? That you and I can read it in the language that we understand? You say, I don't, I don't understand. Hey, here's another thing I can tell you. Get the version Bible app. Open it up to the English translations. Find one that you, whenever you read, it's like, oh, I understand what that means. Then you are well on your way. You can do this. But whenever you go back to translation, whenever you go from one language to another, there are so many different ways this can take place. Typically, what they would do is look in the old language and find out there's a word, and it means this. And then you turn over to the new language, in our case, English, and you look through that dictionary and you find a word that means the same thing as that word. With me? Okay, this means yes. This is no. Okay. For example, if you look into a document over here and it says theos, that means God. So you look into English and you find the word God. <laughs> See? How, you go, I can translate the Bible. <laughs> Or uh, how about this one, I uos. There's an interesting one. Do you know what that means? It means to be loosed, to be free. I uos. It's like, I like free better. Okay. You see what I'm saying? But what do you do when you look in an old language and you find a word and you understand its meaning, but then you get into the new language and you go, yeah, we don't got one of those. What do you do? Well, the reason they, I mean, what they do in those situations is what is called transliteration. And that is you try and take the letters of the first word, you know, the original word, and you try and find it, you try and sound it out. So you're going, why are you telling us this? Because that's how we got baptism. That's how we got baptized is that they looked in Greek and the word is baptizo. But there was no word that meant the exact same thing, so they took all the letters from Greek and tried to get them into English, and what we wound up with, instead of baptizo, we have baptize. It sounds like the same word, and when it entered into English language, it actually became a new word that we use even to this day. Now, most of us in this room would agree that baptize feels very religious. Are you, are you with me on that? And yet the word baptize, as it was used in most of ancient language, has absolutely nothing to do with religion. In fact, one of the most outstanding examples is in 200 B.C., there's a guy by the name of Nicanor, and he had a great pickle recipe. And in his pickle recipe, he said that you should take the vegetable and bop toe in, bo in boiling water, which means to dip it or to plunge it, or to soak it, or to dip it in boiling water. So according to the recipe, you baptize in boiling water, and then you baptizo, baptize again in vinegar, and then when that cucumber dies, it goes to heaven. <laughs> no, you just get a good pickle. But you see what I'm saying is that it is a word and it's simply meant to wash, to plunge, to dip underwater. Or it often had to do with something like a sinking ship or anything that was submerged. This word shows up 63 different times in the New Testament. And sometimes when they were translating it into English, they would use the word wash. When they'd see that, they'd put wash in there. And then sometimes they would use the word uh, 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 baptize. They'd transliterate the word. That's why whenever you read scripture, sometimes you feel like it's confusing. Like when Mark, uh, 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 when Mark was telling us about Jesus, there were people who came and said, you know, Christ does not wash before the meal. Did they mean he doesn't get baptized before? For the, you see how it can get so weird or like, you know, go into all the world and wash people. <laughs> hmm. 
That's how the word got to us. But let's look at what actually was happening when they used this word. Is that when Jesus showed up on the scene, the Jewish culture in which he was born into during Jesus' time on earth, the Jewish culture, um, there were people who were Gentiles. In other words, they were not born into the Jewish culture. They were not raised in the Jewish culture. But someone like me, a Gentile, would want to say, you know, I see the law of Moses. I see Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and I, I want to live that way. Can I become a Jewish person? And then then that's when the Jewish people said, yes, there is a process. You will need to be circumcised. You need to share in a covenant meal. You need to embrace the law of Moses. You need to go to the, uh, to the temple or as close to it as you can get and offer a sacrifice. And then you need to experience a ceremonial washing. So if I heard you right, first of all, I need to have surgery. Okay, I'm going to have to rethink church membership on that one. But anyway... Uh, Passover, and then I need to embrace the Torah, and then I need to go to the temple. And then whenever it says a ceremonial cleansing, in that day there was what they would call, they're, they're, they're essentially big hot tubs. And anyway, they, they would pass through, and you do this privately. No one did this to you. You'd walk down these steps, go all the way under, and then come out the other steps. That was your ceremonial washing in a mikvah. No one washed you. But you were saying, as you tried to enter the Jewish culture, the Jewish way of life, you would be saying, I'm cleansing myself from all of my Gentileness. I'm leaving all my Gentileness before, my former way of life, my sin, because I did not acknowledge God as Jehovah, Yahweh. And then whenever I emerge from the water, then I'm identifying myself with Yahweh, with Judaism and the, and the God of the Jews. And so... When telling your Greek friends about what you had done, you would say in that time, speaking Greek, I dipped or I baptized, oh, I had a wash of conversion. I'm converting from this to that. I, a wash of conversion, and, 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 and it was a, it was a I'm, 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 I was one type and now I'm a different type. And that's how it started getting used they used an everyday word about dipping things underwater. That's how it started being used in a religious context. Now imagine if that's what you knew about that word while you were standing, because imagine with me being about, uh, this would be around 30 AD, while you were standing on the banks of the Jordan River in Israel, and you're listening to this really, really odd, loud, intense, wild preacher who seems to keep saying the same thing over and over again, and that's why you said, I've got to go out and hear this man for myself. Because he is making headlines. He is all over Instagram, I'm just telling you. And his repetitive message to you and everybody in your neighborhood was, Repent! 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 Meaning, change your mind. You're thinking the wrong way. If you change the way you think, you will change your direction. Repent! Turn around. Go the other direction. Anybody who loves Sunday school and wants a good gold star, can you tell me the first name of the man that I'm talking about? Correct. There's at least four people listening to what I'm saying today. This is exciting. His name, first name, was John. And John's message to the Jewish people of his time is, God is about to do something very unique, and it's going to happen right here in our neighborhood. You need to get ready for it. And if you aren't right with God, if you aren't orienting yourself toward God, you are going to miss this. He said, being Jewish, it's not enough. Having Abraham as your, 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 your father of all your faith, it's not enough. The temple, not enough. Sacrifice, not enough. It just ain't good enough. What you need to do you knuckleheads, because that's the way he would preach. You need to quit sinning. And you need to repent. And you need to surrender your life to God. And you are ready to repent when you... In fact, I want you all to know that you are ready to repent and you will show it if you will come down into this water down here in the Jordan River and let me in some way dip you, dunk you, put you under the water... And we don't know his particular method, but we know that he put people all the way under the water. And for those of you who are now just starting to get the picture, 
This guy also adopted a nickname. His first name was John, but he came known as John the or the baptizer. Yes, the dipper. John the dipper. John the immerser. John the scrubber. Why? Because he was so closely associated with this religious and spiritual issue or decision of saying you need to get right with God. It wasn't that kind of baptism of going into the mikvah and saying I'm switching from being Gentile to being Jewish. He was saying it's not that kind of baptism. This, that was private. This is public. This is going public and you don't care who knows. Because what John invited people to do was a washing of the... It was, it was more like, I believe that the message this man is preaching, is, that, that he's preaching, is very clear. And I'm going public with the fact that I'm not just a listener here on the banks of the Jordan River. I am not ashamed to say I'm associating with that man because I believe his message of getting right with God because God's about to do something really cool and new. He said, I'm not ashamed. You know, you'd be saying I'm not ashamed to say I am all in with him and his message. Everybody tracking with me so far? Okay. John was calling people to go public with what they believed. There was something happening on the inside of them and he wanted them to show it on the outside of them. So, get the picture. And I love telling this story because to me, this is one of the most unbelievable moments. Because you know that John, the baptizer, was a cousin of Jesus Christ. That was cool. Anyway, can you imagine John's down there doing his thing? Because he'd grow a crowd and, and, and he was he's dunking people. He was all wet in the middle of the river. And then he's doing his message and all of a sudden he stops and catches a glimpse of someone up on the bank. And he, <laughs> he stops and he looks and he points. He's like, everybody, look, look, look over there. That is the Lamb of God. And he's going to carry away. He's going to take it on himself. He's going to carry away all the sin of the world. You know, I've told you about him. Some of you think I'm the chosen one. And he says, I've told you time and time again, I am not the chosen one. I'm the one who's trying to get everybody ready for him. But let me tell you, everybody look, let me introduce you. There is the chosen one. Yeah. Yeah. And then you think, well, it's great. And then the curtains close. Music. Da, 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 da. Nope. That scene is not over. His cousin, Jesus of Nazareth, comes down into the water and says to John, I need you to baptize me. Okay, just put yourself in the position of John. Say what? John's response was, oh, I, I can't. I can't do that. If we're comparing each other, I'm not even worthy. I, I don't even have enough clout to be the guy who takes off your sandals before you come into the water. That's why we say around here, y'all, we're a colossal collection of moral fallops. John was used by God, but he was just as messed up. That's you and me. Just a good testimony that God uses Ordinary people to do extraordinary things. I, well, mm, mm mm. But anyway, John says, I can't, I'm not qualified. And yet Jesus said, You have to. He insisted. Why? Because Jesus knew that if people watched while John baptized him, then they would see him, talking about Jesus, agreeing with and giving his stamp of approval to the message that John had already been preaching. Because Jesus was in full agreement with what John said, and that is, you need to repent. You've been going the wrong direction. Don't orient yourself toward the temple. Orient yourself toward the God who wants to know you. I just, when I try to imagine such a crazy scene, you've got a sinner baptizing the Savior... Strange, 
But then something even stranger happened, and that's when the people that followed Jesus, we call them his disciples, we know of the 12, that they're very important, and probably about 120 altogether, but all of Jesus' disciples apparently then began baptizing people who heard about Jesus, believed onto him, that he was the Messiah, that he was the chosen one, and as soon as they had heard about Jesus, continued to follow, and then they believed on to Jesus. I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. I believe that he is the one and only Messiah. He is the only one come from God that can save me. They would baptize these people because these people would say, I want to align myself with the message and the person of Jesus Christ. Y'all with me? Okay. Baptism then is a public symbol that you identified with someone and their message. In addition to the fact that it has these roots in being a a picture of, of being cleansed and moving from the old and into the new. So, you're going, great, thank you so much. I'll share that at my next cocktail party. Okay. It's important, y'all. Because what we do here today is going to be celebrating lives that have changed. Dead people made alive. Sinful people forgiven and free. It's an amazing thing. That's how baptism got launched and how it came to us today. Then when Jesus was leaving and said, here's your marching orders, he said, you need to get out of here. Go. You're standing here looking at the the, the sky. Go, get out of here and tell everybody about what I've said, tell them about what I've done, tell them about my life, my my death, my burial, a resurrection. Tell them about everything that I've modeled. And then anyone who hears you tell about me, Jesus says. And when those people decide that they're going to trust onto me and they're going to become my followers, you need to do what I'm telling you to do and I want you to do to baptizo them. Because it's not enough that they've made a decision on the inside. That's a start. They have made a statement of faith on the inside, but now it's time to show evidence on the outside of what's been happening on the inside. Ooh, that's good. That's good stuff. Some of you have trusted Jesus Christ. You've done the first part. But you haven't done the second part. Does that mean you're not saved? No. Jesus made that clear because there was a fellow dying on the cross next to him and he actually said, I do believe that you are the Messiah. He did not have time to come down off of that cross, get baptized, get back up on that cross, and then go to heaven. Baptism doesn't save you. It's a willing testimony to let people, to, uh, let people know that Jesus has saved you. It's a good way to tell people what's been going on in your life. So with all of that history as a clear background, here we are. And some of you are going, are you going to get to the fill in the blanks? (laughs) For this next little bit, I want you to think in word pictures. Because whether you've been baptized as I was whenever I was 12 years old, after I had made a decision to trust Jesus as my forgiver and leader, or as some of my friends, and I look across this room, that I've had the distinct and humbling pleasure to be able to baptize you as an adult, or whether you've been sitting on the edge and the ledge going, I think I want to do that, but I'm not sure. I want you to hear these things, either to be reminded or to be convinced so that you can take the step forward and say, I want to get baptized. Here's what I want you to know. The Bible shows us that baptism is like these things. First one I want you to write in the blank is, the Bible shows us that baptism is like the uniform of the Christian life, of the Christ-following life. I've heard people say, you know what, I'm a Christ follower, but I'm not really going to associate with Jesus like in a church or go public. I don't think that's necessary. I'm like, "Mm, I think you're going to have to suit up with Jesus at some point. You're going to have to show that you're on the team. It's kind of like me saying, you know, I, I play basketball. I play NBA level basketball.
there were a couple of people who just laughed at that. <laughs> okay, so I'm vertically challenged. But let's just, you know, roll with this, okay? You go, okay, I'll take it your word. You do play NBA basketball. Which team do you play for? I go, I don't play for any team. I just play NBA basketball. And you're going, you're weird. Okay, that's what I mean is there's an association with it. The, this idea, the uniform of the Christian life, a part of that uniform is believer's baptism. I am a Christ follower, I'm suiting up with Jesus. Believer's baptism literally identifies you with Jesus because we baptize in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. You, when you go under the waters of baptism around here, what you're doing is you're going public and saying, I don't care who knows. In fact, I wish everybody would know that I am pursuing Jesus. Amen. That's why we spent weeks, months even this, this year when we've talked about what does it mean to follow Jesus? It doesn't mean always having faith. Sometimes it means having doubt. It doesn't mean being sinless because we're sinners. You, those are, these are actually prerequisites. You have to be a doubter and a sinner. So he came for. But you keep following him, and as you follow him, he will ask things of you and will cost you. But you are pursuing him, and you want people to know that. And the reason he wants you to go public with that is because think about it, y'all. Jesus is so in love and passionately in love with you, with me, and longing for you to be well and whole, to be forgiven and free like we say in our greeting, that he is the mighty friend of sinners. That he is the ally of his enemies. That he would rather die than be without you. He is so in pursuit of you. That's why the poet called him the hound of heaven. He waded into the middle of our messed up, messy world in order to reach you. And when you finally realize it's very personal then it's time to put on his uniform. You go, I don't, can't explain all of it, but I know that he loves me, and I know he's got a great plan for my life, and I know that I have everlasting life. I don't care who knows that I'm being associated with Jesus. That's why at the conclusion of his sinless life, he willingly laid down his life. He was no martyr. He was a sacrifice. He willingly allowed himself to be nailed to that cross to go through all of the horror and the pain in order to bleed out, in order to specifically die, in order to be put into a tomb as a dead man so that he could prove he had all the victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave. That's why every Sunday is a little big mini celebration of Easter. Oh, y'all! He was resurrected by the awesome power of God. And then what we're asking of each other as we follow Jesus is that now you and I, in faith, get the chance to accept that gift that he has bought for us, forgiveness, purpose, everlasting life. He offers this gift that is given to us by God and paid for by Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Whenever we say yes to the gift, then we suit up. We suit up in the, in, with Jesus' team. And this is the other part that goes with it. And that's what we talked about in this whole church series. And we suit up for the responsibility that comes with that team membership. Y'all tracking with me? In Romans 6, Paul was trying to get at this. He says, don't you know that all of us who have believed and were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We are identifying with it. We're nowhere without it. Whenever we're baptized into this, we are partaking in his death, the one in which he hung up for all of our hang-ups. He died for all of our sin. That's why Paul says, And because of that, therefore, we are therefore buried with him through baptism into death, dying to our old life, 
we're not going to live an improved version of our old life. We're letting go of our old life. It says, through baptism into death, in order that, there's a, the purpose statement, just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. All of, it's faith. All of it is faith. All of it is faith. But you've got to know who your faith is in. That's what's going to make the difference. And he said, Jesus has done it all. Good stuff. The fact is, Jesus expects and instructs us to put on the uniform, and that's why we do it. It's going to be a reenactment of his death, his burial, his resurrection. It's also going to mark, and this is what we've been trying to say all year long, you've got to have a connection. You need a connection to Jesus through your faith. You need a connection to a local body of believers through your commitment to saying, I want to be a part of that. You and I are a part of something big, and, and, and baptism is this picture of you are incorporated into something that is really, really important into something that is really, really big. It's not just doing it so that everybody can go, okay, good, you made it through the class. This is so big that you have an important role. You have an important responsibility on this team. It's called being the church. If you say, I don't understand, go back and listen to the last seven weeks. Talked about why church is significant. This is important. You belong. I'm going to put on my you belong here, shirt, when we get ready to baptize, because you belong here. You need the connection, you need the belonging, and you need it to be a part of every other redeemed person who's around here. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay, uniform. Let's go to another one. The Bible also seems to indicate and shows us that baptism is like the ID tag of the Christ-following life. And some of you are so astute and you love filling in those blanks and you've got notes next to notes and stuff. But you're going, well, isn't that the same thing? Uniform, identification, ID tag, same thing, isn't it? Yep, it's the same, only different. <laughs> they both help identify something. Yeah, we're good with that. Because in a, a, a uniform... A uniform identifies your team. But an ID represents access. I don't think we're to that point yet, but I've always wondered if we could get locks on our doors around here to where, you know, some of you probably have to do this if you work at a bank or something. You carry around a little ID card, and I want one of those things that, you know, little belt things, like pull it out and... <laughs> you know. I think it'd be really cool to just go around all the rooms and like, chink, chink. Just scan my little ID tag and open all the doors. That'd be fun. Some of you are going, you are so weird. So weird. <laughs> I'm just thinking that an ID tag is a little bit more personal. Because a uniform, other people are wearing the uniform, but an ID tag, that's got my picture on it. It's got my number. Because it's one thing to admit that you respect Jesus. It's one thing to say, oh, I admire Jesus. He was, a, he was amazing. You could even say, I, I actually revere Jesus. And all of those things are good, y'all. You could say, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm so in admiration of what he did. That he died on the cross and all that. Some 2,000 years ago. But admiration is one thing. It's a whole nother thing. To lay it all on the line. To say, I'm in with that man. I told this story. It's not in my notes, but I was just thinking about fuel just now. Last time we met, two weeks ago, I told a story that's been told many, many times. Maybe you've heard it. Maybe you haven't. It's the difference between this just suiting up and getting an ID tag and all this. There was once a fellow, and I think his first name was Charles. I'm trying to think his last name. Doesn't matter. It'll come to me here in a minute. This is why you have notes, so that you don't have to do this in front of everybody. <laughs> What's his name? Anyway, he lived about the turn of the, uh, the 19th to 20th century, and he was an aerialist. He could tightrope walk uh, 
Blondin. There it is. Found it. We can all go back to normal now. I just found it. Okay. His name was Charles Blondin, and he, um, tightrope walker, very, very good. He's very famous. You can go and look him up. Um, he stretched a cable across Niagara Falls. It was about 1,100 feet of cable. And he drew a crowd back in the day when there was no Instagram and all that stuff. But he was, he was quite the showman, and he would do all kinds of things. Walk out to the middle of the, the, uh, the, the tightrope over the you know, Niagara Falls, and he would sit down and have um, lunch while other people watched. And then he'd continue on, and then he'd come back, and all this kind of stuff. Then one time, he's like, well, let's kick this up a notch. And he got a wheelbarrow, and he put the wheelbarrow on the cable, and he pushed the wheelbarrow across the, the cable. Uh, and he's like, ooh, ah, wow, it's fantastic. He came back, and as the story goes, after he stepped off the cable, um, there was one guy who was, you know, happened to be you know, up near the, <laughs> the platform. He said, like, that's amazing. That's amazing. And Charles was like, thank you so much. Do you believe that I could do such and such? like, yeah, I believe you could do that. He's like, do you believe I could do anything that I wanted to on this particular uh, tightrope? He's like, I have no, no doubt that you, Mr. Blondin, could do whatever you want to do. He said, uh, get into my wheelbarrow. <laughs> That's kind of what the teenagers said, too. <laughs> That's the difference I'm trying to get over to you. There's a difference between saying, I admire what Jesus did, and saying, Jesus, you said I ought to live this way with my money and my language and my thought and my behavior and my relationships and my everything. Because Jesus is essentially saying, if you do believe all those things, then get into the wheelbarrow. Woo hoo hoo. Okay, so admiration is one thing. When you have to say, I'm going to lay it all on the line, what you're saying is, I am willing, Jesus, at this point, to make the choice to turn the control switch of my life from self-control over to Christ control. Romans 6, here's another thing that Paul said. He said, for we know, not guess or wonder or hope, we know, that after this faith in Christ, that we move into this, we know that our old self was crucified with Him. It dies. The old self dies. And here's a two-word phrase, so that. It means for the purpose of. So that the body of sin might be done away with. In other words, it doesn't, sin has no control over me anymore. Now, sometimes I give it control. But I am not bound and determined. I am not uh, forced into that. He says that the body of sin might be done away with so that, uh, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. I've told you this before, church. Jesus' salvation is ongoing. If you trust him with your life, if you say, I want you to be my forgiver and leader, the very first thing he does is he saves you from the penalty <laughs> of sin. He has paid the price. He was penalized for all of your sin, past, present, and future. What he's trying to do in your life, in my life, every single day, is he's showing us how he has freed us and saved us from the power of sin over us in our day-to-day -day life. Sin does not have to have power over us. We can grow to be stronger than the sin that confronts us. And then one day, when we get to see him face to face, he, ha he will have saved us from the very presence of sin. I'm just saying he is a great savior. So if you, my friend, are going to be identified with Jesus Christ, what he is saying to you is you must die to the old way of doing things. Your, your old feelings, train them in the new way. Your, your old language, the way that you dealt with your money, the way you take care of your relationships, Everything, it needs to go away and it needs to be replaced. It needs to be accepted that his brand new way of life is what you are going to live. This, this is not very, it's probably not very PC, but that's okay. What I'm also saying to you at this point is, 
if the Bible tells us that baptism is like an ID tag, I would say more specifically, it's more like a toe tag. And if you watch CSI, you know what that is. So. Because if you don't know what a toe tag is, that is an ID card that signifies the end of your life as you knew it. I've lived long enough to where there are so many songs. I was talking to a friend about how many songs we could sing. And right now, y'all, I could sing and sing and sing. I got so much repertoire in my head. Mm -mm -mm. But there's one that really had a deep impact on me back whenever I was a teenager. And the Imperials Quartet came out with a song called Water Grave. I'm not going to sing it for you because it's a rock and roll song and I'm not really a rock and roll singer. Um... But I will tell you what the poet who wrote these lyrics said. The song goes, In my house, there's been a mercy killing. The man I used to be has been crucified. And the death of this man was the final way of revealing. In the spiritual way, to live, I had to die. Remember this, babe? Yeah. Now, if I let that dead man linger in me, I might get a little idle in my ways. So I'm going down to the Celebration River, and I'm going to take this dead man down to a water grave. Woo! Oh, I might sing it. I'm going down to the river, my Lord, and I'm going to be buried alive. Okay, I want to show my heavenly father that the man I used to be has finally died. Mm. Now, when I think of where I'm going in terms of where I've been, it makes me glad to know, my Lord, that I have been born again. Mm. 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 Oh, y'all, if you have been standing on the edge of the ledge trying to figure out whether you should trust Jesus, I'm here to tell you, you should trust Jesus today. Let go of your old life. Start taking steps into your brand new life. Hey, there's going to be enough time by between the time we say our final amen in this service and the time when we get baptized. I bet I could shimmy you in today. Anyway, in other words, when you're baptized, you are saying, yes, I believe Christ died, he was buried, he came back to life in order to take away the sin of my life and the sin of the world. But I also believe, when you go into this baptism today, I also believe that I am taking advantage of that forgiveness and I'm taking advantage of that power, resurrection power. And in order to do this, I have to die to the old life, as Jesus said, and be born again. And when I'm born again, he gives me new power, a new spirit-powered life that never ends. And so I'm going to illustrate it. I'm going to be a living illustration. I'm going to get baptized because I want people not only to see the passion play of Jesus, I want to see the passion play of my life. It's my death, my burial, my resurrection, and I'm going to be living a brand new life. Are y'all getting anything out of this today? Yes. Okay, yeah. Okay, one more. The Bible shows us that baptism is like the wedding ring of the Christian life. The, the, the wedding ring of the Christ-following life. Okay, let's flash back. Okay, a long time ago, in a land not so far away, a young prince encountered a fair young maiden which is the fairy tale way of saying she was easy on the eyes and a blast to be with. <laughs> and after a whirlwind courtship, he requested her hand in marriage. Well, actually all of her, but her hand in marriage. <laughs> and the kingdom rejoiced at the news of their wedding. And as that ceremony progressed, they exchanged solemn and sacred vows. And to mark the occasion in a lasting manner, they exchanged rings in which 
he had the date of their wedding engraved on the inside so that he would never forget their anniversary. (laughs) (laughs) They exchanged rings as a token of their love for and their commitment to each other. And they lived blissfully happy ever after. (laughs) The end. (laughs) Online campus, you could not see my bride going. (laughs) And that's why I would say what I just told you is mostly true. (laughs) We've been together in marriage 40 years. It's been... As we like to say, 32. <laughs> Two things I usually say. It's amazing they would let 12 year olds get married, but that was Texas after all. <laughs> the other thing is, we've been married for 40 years. We like to say it's 32 of the happiest years of our life. Um, now, the truth of it is, we did stand up in front of God and everybody, and. Um, We did exchange solemn and meaningful vows, and in front of a bunch of witnesses, um, we did exchange rings so as to remind us of the promise that we made and to show others that we were committed. Um, We have not lived blissfully ever after. We haven't. Um, But I will tell you this. That was not the end. That was the beginning. In a deeper way, I want you to understand that baptism is like the wedding ring of the Christian life, of the Christ-following life. Because when you and I come to Jesus, when we come to Christ with a sincere faith and a repentant heart like we've been talking about, you're actually entering into a covenant relationship that is very similar to marriage. You are making promises, you're making vows, and the fact that they're vows and commitments is that they are based on that promise. And what we're saying, and he certainly keeps his end of the bargain, is it's a promise with no expiration date. See. And I do say commitments because we make a commitment to Christ, but you understand that whenever you turn your life over to him, he's making a commitment to you. I will save you. I will give you purpose. I will forgive you of your sin. He is always faithful to his, even whenever we, as we sang early in the service, He knows we're going to stumble and fall, but He doesn't give up on us. He will forgive you and He will keep you forever. But He asks us to give it everything we've got to be faithful to Him when things are blissful and going great. And then also to be faithful faithful to Him whenever they're anything but blissful. And what he asks is for you to follow his lead. That's what we do this for all the time. We're trying to figure out what is our next best step with Jesus. And what we do is we follow, we believe, we obey. We follow, we believe, we obey. And one of the first instructions that he gives to his followers is be baptized. Just like he was baptized as a simple act of an illustration of obedience to God. Don't overcomplicate baptism. It doesn't save you. It actually shows what God's been doing in your life. You can read about these 64 different times that it's mentioned. I just tell you that Paul, who used to be like a terrorist against what we now know as Christianity and Christ following, and Jesus got a hold of his life, it didn't take long, but somebody baptized him. He trusted in Jesus. He got baptized. There's this, this situation, you can read about that, by, uh, by the way, in Acts 9. Um, the Philippian jailer, I love that because that was jailhouse rock. That's, that's Acts 16. That was even before Elvis. Just telling you. That jailhouse rocked and that Philippian jailer thought the whole world was coming to an end. And Paul told him about Jesus. And he said, I believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And I believe he will do what he said he will do. And that night, Paul baptized him and all his whole family. Just saying, baptisms are really cool. Here's one that I put in your notes for you. Acts chapter 8, verses 35 and, and, uh, through 38. Philip, one of the disciples, he, he was, he's, he's going on. He's just trying to tell people about what Jesus was doing. It says, then Philip, who he, he just was walking down the road, minding his own business. And this guy who was a, a politician, a bureaucrat of some sort, was driving by in his chariot. And he was reading the scroll of Isaiah. 
didn't know what he was reading about. Philip dr- jumps up there next to him in, in, in the co-pilot seat, and he starts explaining that it was about Jesus. And then G- uh, it says here, And Philip began with the scripture and told this man about the good news about Jesus. And as they traveled along that road, they came to some water, and this man who had made his, his, his he put, placed his faith in Jesus right then, he said, Look, here's water. He said, Why, why shouldn't I be baptized right now? And Philip said, If you believe... With all of your heart, you may. And the man answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So they went down into that water and Philip baptized him. Wasn't big and formal, but boy, was that a celebration. Never know what's going to happen to you while you're walking down the road. (laughs) Got to wrap this up. Some people think, well, I haven't gotten baptized because I'm not good enough. Am I going to have to start all over with this again? It's not reserved for people who are good enough. The reason that he came to save us was because we're not good enough. You could never be good enough. That's the whole point. And besides that, stop looking at baptism like it's a graduation ceremony. It is not a graduation ceremony. It is an initiation ceremony. It's like that ring on my hand, just like marriage. Did we know all that we were getting into when we said, I do? (laughs) No, we did not. (laughs) No. I don't know. My, my bride said that's a little overdone. I'm like, no, I don't think it was. I'm talking about when you trust Jesus, you're going to go through the good, the bad, and the ugly, just like you do when you go into marriage. You, you, you make the commitment, you stand by it, come what may. Being obedient to Christ is very much the same way. You have no idea the places he's going to take you. He will challenge you at the spot where you are most comfortable because comfort lulls you into thinking you got it. And he's got it, not you. Just telling you. But you know that he deserves 100% total sold out commitment. And that you want the world to know that you stand with Jesus. And so you obey him and you get baptized and you put on the wedding ring and you don't care who knows it. Because this ring, I can take it off right now. Am I now not married? I'm still married. What made the difference is the faith or the vow, the commitment. I put that on to remind people. The Bible is clear that, the, that baptism doesn't make you a, a Christ follower. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, it says it's by grace. That's why we sang about it. It's by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves because it is the gift of God, and it is not something you can work for. It's not by works, and the reason is so that nobody could boast about it. Can you imagine going to heaven if it had to do with a point system? You thought you did pretty good, and you get up there, and you say, yeah, I, I got here because I scored like 1,100 points. Like, they go, <laughs> bless your heart. And some other guy would go. <laughs> I'm just saying, it has nothing to do with that as a gift. Baptism is not something you do to get into heaven. It is not something you do to help someone else get into heaven, either living or dead. Baptism is not something you do to your kids. Now, hopefully you understand all that. Anyway, the bottom line that, 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 that the, the, the Bible has is that bi- baptism is a choice. Baptism is a choice to suit up, to make that commitment to let Jesus lead your life. It's a simple act of obedience. The water doesn't make you. It shows that you, it doesn't make you a Christ follower. It shows that you already are one. Now, some are going public with this belief today, and I will hope that you will rearrange your plans if you weren't planning on being here for the picnic. That's going to be fun, but the baptism is worth your time. And then you can have your life back, you know, around 1.30 and it'll be fine. You, you, you can do it. Yeah, I believe it. There are some people in this room right now who have said, I want to put on the uniform, the ID tag, and the wedding ring of the, Chris, of the Christ following life today because they have already professed their faith in Christ. But they're celebrating. They're celebrating this new life uh, in front of us and we're going to rejoice with them. Before they get baptized, this is the way we're going to work it. We're going to have the, uh, the, uh, the, the picnic time. I'll call everybody up to the east porch. You bring your camp chair and we'll sit there. We're going to have a quick ba- baby dedication because this, this, this couple, I'm so thrilled that they want to raise their beautiful daughter in, in, in knowing Jesus Christ. And then the six who are going to be baptized, uh, they'll tell their story. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then we'll get in the water. It's going to be great. And we'll, I'll only hold people down according to the level of their sinfulness. Um, <laughs> that, that was for you, Terry. Okay. <laughs> nah, 
No, nah, Jesus already wiped all that away. I'm just telling you. Jesus is so, so good. Mm. But through Jesus, God is truly doing something great around here. I just cannot tell you what a wonderful day this is for me. This is, this is actually why I gave my life to trying to serve the church. I want to see lives changed so badly, so badly. So if you've been thinking, I want to do that, or I, I want my life to change, how does change happen? Where can I find the change? Got, got two words for you, and then we're done. The two words are do and done, do and done. Some of you have been living on the old plan. You think the word do. If I keep doing enough good things, then God's going to love me and he's going to let me into heaven. And I'm saying you need to switch over to the plan of done. Because Jesus has done everything that is necessary. Everything that is necessary for you to have your past forgiven. A purpose for living. And a future in heaven. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Mm, good, good stuff. If you want to become a Christ follower today, I say stop the doing and just rely on what Jesus has already done. And once you do that, let's celebrate your change. Let's celebrate the little change Jesus has brought for you. We're going to baptize again before long. But if you do want to get baptized today, still time. I want you all to know. Did you all get it? Good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the privilege of being able to share this. Where it came from, what it means, where it's going. Um. The fact that you, almighty, holy God, would make a way for us to have salvation, to have purpose, and to have everlasting life. That just is mind-blowing. Lord, please help this to sink in on a lot of our hearts. We've already been baptized, but maybe we've forgotten what it all means. And I say to you, Lord, please refresh our memories so that we can live like people who mean it, that we keep spreading the word that there is hope, and his name is Jesus Christ. And for my friends who have never surrendered themselves to you, would you please give them the courage to simply say, Jesus, I need you. I need your forgiveness. I need your purpose. I need your leadership. I'm giving my life to you today, and I know you will respond. You always do. Thank you so much for all that you do. Take this last song as our prayer, and uh, may you be blessed by it, God. I love you so much, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.